Welcome to the Dialogue Book Report, where we talk about literature of interest to LDS readers. I'm Andrew Hall, a book review editor at Dialogue Journal of Mormon Thought. And today we're going to do our annual year in review of books on Mormonism, Mormon studies. So looking back on 2023 and what were the books that we thought were most significant, that we loved, that we wanted to share with you. And today I'm joined, as I have been by the last few years, by my two co-hosts, Christina Rossetti, the nonfiction book review editor here at Dialogue, and Andrew Hamilton, the book review editor at the Association for Mormon Letters. Welcome. Alan. Hey, Christina, tell us about your your updates in, in your life and career these days. Well, well, Andrew, um, I am going to unfortunately no longer be the nonfiction book review editor of Dialogue. Um, I've done this for a few years and it's been, I mean, Dialogue's great. Uh, I, it's such a good journal. Um, but me or Joey and myself are going to be the editors of Mormon Studies Review. So we're going to be doing that, which is really exciting. Um, and then also I'm moving to Canada. So as a non-academic update, I'm going to the Great White North. Great. Congratulations on all those all those changes. Uh, we'll be missing you here at Dialogue, but we're glad to know that you'll, you'll still be leading one of our other great journals here in the Mormon Studies Review. Okay, well, tell us about some books that you're interested in from this last year. Well... Uh, so this year, there was two books that are kind of similar that I want to mention together, one of which I've been excited about for since I met the author. Um, I met I was fortunate enough to meet Mason Allred really early when I was just a grad student in Mormon studies. And he came out with his book, uh, Seeing Things, uh, which is a uh, look at the technology, what he calls the technologies of vision and the making of Mormonism. And I met him because he was interested, like I was, in spiritualism and ghosts and the ghost in the machine and all of that kind of really interesting stuff of the 19th century. Uh, and Mormonism emerges in a weird time in American history. Um, there was ectoplasmic mist and there was a rise in electricity and there was Morse code and the telegram. And in the midst of kind of all of these new technologies, Mormonism emerges and it bridges this gap between the temporal and the spiritual. And so he does this really theoretically rich, magnificent overview of what that looks like for how Mormonism brought together this technological revolution that changed everything for the world. Um, and so I, I, it brought so many strands. I, I think when I imagine Mormon studies, so much of the time I've kind of talked about how it is a fairly like insular field, and it, he really bridges the gap between what's really happening that's interesting with the theoretical studies of religion, with religious studies broadly, and bringing in a lot of those broader conversations. Um, and so that was it was. 10 out of 10. Um, and then similar to that, the other book that's kind of along those lines uh, was Eternity in the Ether um, by Gavin Feller. Um, I first, which is Seeing Things by Mason Allred, is University of North Carolina. Eternity in the Ether is Illinois. Um, and I first heard about this because um, Gavin was the um, Mormon Studies fellow at the University of Utah shortly before I was. I don't remember. And um, he wrote a book on media representation. And this is something that is, I mean, I don't think he could have published this at a better time, at a more opportune time. Um, there have been how many Netflix, HBO, and Hulu specials on Mormonism in the last five years. And all of a sudden, we get this history of Mormons in media. Um, and in, through a lens of media analysis and communications and um, so for anyone who's kind of watching all the Netflix specials, we have a new one coming out that a um, good friend of mine, Lindsay Hanson Park, consulted on for the LeBaron group. Um, for anyone who's kind of watching those Netflix specials and who's interested, can't recommend looking at a history of what this is like for Mormonism with Gavin Feller. Yeah, that's amazing that these two media studies books um, came out really in conversation with each other uh, at almost the same time. That's a very rich moment there. All right, yeah. Andrew. You, oh, go ahead. I was saying, 
as Mason Allred talks about, it's uncanny. So, Andrew, uh, tell us about some books that you're interested in these days, and if you have any other any updates for us, uh, go ahead. Not a lot changed uh, for me this last year. So up here in Southern Idaho, teaching at the uh, college here in town in Twin Falls and just having a good old time. So I wanted to start out by talking about a couple of my favorite fun uh, books from this year. I'm a huge fan of the work of Matt Page. Uh, People might remember, if you remember him, he got started by doing creative artwork. If you were to look up his website, he's got you know, Brigham in with a beard of bees and Lorenzo Snow eating a snow cone and these kind of silly type things. He did a series of cards based on the garbage pill kids of the 80s. He likes to do a lot of stuff with kind of these you know, comics and things that he grew up with in the 80s and 90s. And several years ago, he started his series of graphic novels, Future Day Saints. And he's concluded that trilogy uh, this year with uh, the third book, the new arrivals and he continues on all these characters from the earlier books and their adventures and takes that story forward and i'm really hoping this turns out to be a douglas adams style trilogy where there's five or six books in the trilogy much like with the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy trying to convince him to keep doing more because they're so great but i would encourage anyone who likes to support weird mormon stuff independent artists to pick up a copy of, of all of the Future Day Saints volumes if you don't have them yet. But this third one, The New Arrivals, is just very fun. Like I said, it continues on these stories with hot drinks and Mr. Kane and all of the other fun uh, characters that he's come up with uh, as they're living off hundreds of years in the future on an alien planet, bringing all these different uh, characters and aliens who all embrace some form of Mormonism living off in the far future. Another one he did was a fr- uh, not directly Mormon itself, but definitely a lot of ideas in it that he would have gleaned from growing up in the church. Uh, several years ago, Matt started, a, he drew a couple of uh, drawings of this young lady with this kind of alien uh, creature from the Black Lagoon looking sort of child. And he continued to draw these at various points in their life. And he compiled them into a small zine this year called Family Portrait. And there's no words uh, in this. It's all just drawings. And it starts with an image of the young woman while she's pregnant with the child. And this uh, picture of the unborn child uh, who turns out to be this alien, again, looking creature. And then pictures of him uh, and them together as he's an infant, a toddler, uh, school pictures as he grows older and then her at a much older age uh, apparently dying of cancer or something similar and it, it, it's really a very sweet and touching i find a uh, little book especially if for a, a, such a small comic with no words and i just absolutely love uh, this little book family portrait by matt page and would encourage anybody to uh, maybe get on his website and get a copy of that support him and and pick up these fun little uh, creative, uh, fictional, Mormon-related volumes. All right, thank you. Yes, Matt Page is is one of my favorites. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk about more. Uh, well, more. What Andrew started with us with these uh, with Matt Page's books on the literary side of things, and I will continue with that. I'm going to talk about later on. I'll talk about your novels, which is a relatively quiet year compared to, to some previous years. A very active year in short fiction. Uh, but let me start with creative nonfiction. Um, we had uh, books by both Melissa Inoue and Kate Holbrook. Um, actually, three books in total from those two authors in 2023. And these are both historians who have had success at the highest levels, um, but also came to work at the church history department. Uh, both struggled with cancer. Uh, Kate of course, passed away in August 2022 from eye cancer. Melissa Inouye is, 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 is in recovery and doing very well. We hope to pray that, that that continues. But they both had, I wouldn't say they were memoirs, both have it's kind of a clutch of essays about faith in the current world and the struggles of faith. So Melissa Waitzing Inouye's book is called Sacred Struggle, Seeking Christ on the Path of 
most resistance. And, and both these books come out from Desert Book. Uh, I think one or both of them are also in conjunction with the Maxwell Institute. But they come from Desert Book, so they're getting wide release. Um, and Kate Holbrook's uh, posthumous book is Both Things Are True. Um, let me just... So they both kind of look at the complexity of living as a believing uh, woman, but also uh, people who are facing the inequalities and difficult histories of the past. You know, these are historians. and But looking at it in a very charitable view. Uh, here, let me read one quote. Uh, this, is from, this is from a review from Conor Hilton. He said, Throughout sacred struggle, Melissa in no way offers a new way of thinking about the church, primarily as a network of people, a community. Building on this way of thinking, she writes that instead of being a refuge from human problems, I've come to see our church as a sort of central problem hub, connecting us with the, all the afflictions of humanity. What Melissa goes on to describe is that the church connects us with countless people and through those connections with all the afflictions of humanity. Uh, so, it, you know, it's an op opportunity she sees the church as a plant, place to practice Christ-like responses to the problems of the world. So she looks at patriarchy, gender inequality in the church head on. Um, but, you know, again, is is charitable to people in the past. Uh, there's one more quote. She says, patriarchal hierarchies have delivered the world in which we live now. Some might say this world is rotten. Burn it all down. But alas, the earth is like a spaceship traveling around the sun with a fixed allotment of air, water, food and goodwill. A fire on the spaceship is bad for everyone. Uh, so, and so that's, that's Melissa's Kate Holbrook's uh, posthumous book, and um, put into she put it together towards the end of her life. And her friends, like Rosalind Welch and others, helped get you know finish putting it together. Um, and it, like the title says, both things are true. It insists on a duality of both and approach to faith and life. Um, and she's, I think she has a very generous, open-hearted view to her experiences and other experiences in the church, uh, insisting that you can hold both the loss that you have and and recognize the, the strength that, that comes from the church. And then they also, both of them, uh, I think this was a little bit long, earlier in the works, but there was also a book published by, sorry, it was co-edited by Melissa Inouye and Kate Holbrook called Every Needful Thing, Essays on the Life and, of the Mind and the Heart. Um, from Maxwell Institute. And this was a collection of essays from 23 academics and professionals talking about discipleship. Um, so the, th the the two of them really put out uh, some remarkable books this year that are my strongest recommendations in creative nonfiction. Uh, as long as I'm talking about it, just mention a couple of the memoirs that I think have been very well received. Kayla Thatcher has a novel, has a memoir called Beehive Girl, where she sets up this framework where, as a new mother, she sets out to earn a century-old young woman's award. So this is a LDS uh, young women's program from the early 20th century and uses that to, well, she, she builds furniture and works with chickens and writes essays and tries to connect herself with her LDS foremothers um, and, and kind of the history of, of, of LDS women. It's a very interesting book. So again, looking at her current life, through the view of these, what happened in the past. Uh, one more, Bonnie Young has, uh, oh, it's not a memoir, but uh, it's called Sex Educated. Let, Sex Educated, Letters from a Latter-day Saint Therapist to Her Younger Self. Um, both of these last two books were from BCC Press. So Bonnie Young is a sex therapist, and she writes these letters to herself at various ages in the past and talks about how sexuality has been portrayed by some in harmful and accurate ways, both in and outside the church, and talks about how to build a healthy and true understanding of what sex is. Um, so that's and that's gotten very strong views as well. Those are my creative fiction, creative nonfiction recommendations. Let's go back to Christina. I think we're we're in the middle of a blossoming of works about the Mountain Meadows Massacre. So tell us about the most recent books in that field. Yeah, so I'm going to touch on one. I think Andrew is going to be talking about the other um, that got a lot of attention. Um, but I want to talk about one that I think it was such an interesting approach. Um, it's called Convicting the Mormons, the Mountain Meadows Massacre in American Culture by Janice Johnson. And it is the case that when you, I don't know, 
hear all the ex-Mormons and you hear people talk about like negative things about Mormon history, what's like top top thing that comes up? The Mountain Meadows Massacre. It's It's up there. Everyone knows about it. Very few people know the particulars of the history. Very few people could name. I mean, most people I think maybe could name John D. Lee. I don't know, actually, if, that, if that's true. Um, certainly people can't name that it was September 11th, certainly not 1857. Um, but the partic- So the particulars are a little murky, but we know that we hate the Mountain Meadows Massacre, which is fair. I don't want to pretend that that's not the case. Um, but she takes this approach that the Mountain Meadows Massacre really becomes a sensation early on, not just now in kind of our imagining of what Mormonism was. Um, I'm thinking in terms of even recently under the banner of heaven, juxtaposes the murder of this young woman um, and her child, um, Brenda Lafferty, at, with this horrendous massacre. Um, and so people know that, but and we use it in sensational ways now. But the fact that that was the case in the 19th century, that was something that I really wasn't even familiar with. And so Janice talks about how the massacre was really an initial moment of decrying Mormonism publicly um, and provoking legal action even against Mormonism. And as her title suggests, it was a way of not just condemning John D. Lee and the and the assailants, but it was a way of condemning Mormonism as a religion that was wrong. Um, already, even before the Mountain Meadows Massacre, there was a, quote, Mormon problem in America. Uh, and the Mountain Meadows Massacre almost becomes a way of justifying this problem, of justifying why we already don't like the Mormons. Um, and so it's a really interesting portrayal of how our kind of, all the discussion, similar to what I was saying with the last two books, how all of our media representation, all of our pop culture representations, the way that we talk about Mormonism isn't new. Uh, that this is that Mormonism has been in the spotlight and been in media representation. The media has changed, but the subject of the media hasn't. It was a newspaper then. Today, it's a Hulu series. Um, and so it was a really, for me at least, um, it was an interesting way of seeing that what we're doing isn't anything kind of new. Um, we were really fortunate down in St. George to have Janice come down during our Mount Meadows Massacre tour at the Juanita Brooks Conference um, and have her kind of shed some light on this. And so many more and more, I think people are learning about the massacre, as Andrew will mention when he talks about his book on this. Um, we're learning a lot about the history, but I think we're still kind of forgetting what Janice so artfully does is talk about what that history did in the moment for Mormons. All right, Andrew, do you want to tell us about uh, the the second book in the the Vengeance is Mine book? Yes, certainly. So this is a book that's been waited for for many years. Um, Vengeance is Mine, the Mountain Meadows Massacre and its Aftermath. This was co-authored by Richard E. Turley, uh, who used to be the LDS Church historian, as well as Barbara Jones Brown, who is now running uh, Signature Books. And this is the second half of the story. You'll remember uh, probably that when uh, the first book that the the church helped put out uh, basically went up to the massacre itself and then ended. It didn't cover any of the aftermath, and a lot of people were kind of critical of that, but they said, hey, wait, we're going to get you the rest of the story. And after many years now, uh, they have. I wanted to read just a brief excerpt here from a review by Connor Hilton, who wrote, Vengeance is Mine is a stunning achievement. Uh, Turley and Brown have written an engaging, thoughtful, searching volume that dives into the massacre and what followed, leaving no stone unturned. Brown and Turley's commitment to search for the truth and knowledge is apparent in the level of detail found throughout the book and the robust endnotes and sourcing to support their insights and conclusions. And I agree uh, with Connor. It's very detailed. Uh, they're very blunt and graphic in the uh, violence and horrible things that took place. They don't shy away from the darker details and the things that happened. Uh, this is a well-written book, and I highly recommend it. I will say, and this is my feeling, others might disagree, I think they're too nice to Brigham Young. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's because of their connections with the church, the fact that they both worked for the church or what, but I think they, they try to protect 
Brigham Young, they kind of, to me, they kind of throw the Southern Utah leaders under the bus uh, a little bit and trying to put it more on them and, and distance Brigham Young a bit too much. Um, I would encourage everyone that reads this to also read Will Bagley's book on the subject and some of the others and kind of draw their own uh, conclusions. Uh, certainly read the volume as well that Christina just mentioned. I, I read that one earlier in the year and also thought it was quite fantastic. But it's one of those things everyone's going to have strong opinions on. No one's going to quite agree on on how it all fits together. But a very a very well written and powerful book. I highly encourage everyone to check out Vengeance's Mind. Okay. Um, all right. I'll go again. So let me just mention that. This was a very good year in short fiction. Um, we, I remember last year, Wayfair Magazine had just started uh, publishing. I remember Christina and I were talking about that and we're saying, well, what is this magazine? How, how's this going to be? Um, and they've done some very interesting things this year. And But the thing I've appreciated probably the most is they've been very active in publishing short fiction. Uh, a lot of great authors have been working with them doing some very interesting things. Um, Gabriel Gonzalez has a great speculative not speculative, alternate history of uh, the founding of the church coming from uh, Latin America instead of North America. Um, and and probably maybe most interesting, there's been a series, a whole series of short stories called Tales of Chelm. I think that's how it's pronounced. C-H-E-L-M, First Ward, which is a series by James Goldberg, Nicole Wilkes Goldberg, and Matthias Singh. Uh, so they've had I think maybe six stories so far have come from that with the idea it's based on Eastern European Jewish folk tales um, of this, this town of fools called Chelm. Uh, and, and so people like Isaac was was of the Shinger and others have written about this, this town of fools. And so they've taken this idea and put it into a Mormon context, imagining a Polish town with a, a Mormon ward and the fools that are there, and looking at uh, Mormon culture through these fools. Uh, really fun stories and, and very interesting, you know, a mixture of humor and uh, real insight into Mormon culture. So I recommend that. I think, I think they're going to eventually put those together in, into a collection. Um, Charles Noe, uh, uncle of Melissa that we've talked about before, he has a new short fiction collection called Hymns of Silence that are strong very definitely based on his background in rural central Utah and his interest in, you know, connecting nature with uh, spirituality and, you know, mixing in his background of Mormonism and interest in Eastern religions, uh, particularly Buddhism. Um, and, and I have, I quoted a collection with Robert Rowley called The Path and the Gate, Mormon Short Fiction that came out through Signature uh, this year, a collection of great, almost all new stories by Mormon authors. I I think it's been wonderful, but I'll encourage readers to to pick it up uh, and see what's the state of, of Mormon fiction these days. Okay, so that's short stories. I'll talk about novels in a second, but let's switch back over to Christina. What else do you want to talk about? Yeah, so my next one was one that I was I was really interested and I wanted to mention it. It's a little different. It's not a history or something that I would have normally, I think, gravitated toward. Um, it's Eric Huntsman and Deidre Green's Latter-day Saint Perspectives on Atonement. Um, and this was really timely to me, to me at least. Um, about a few years ago, there was a long-standing discussion on Christian Twitter about atonement theories and what atonement theory do you believe in and what atonement theory do, and people were like fighting over penal substitution versus Christus Victor. And I made the mistake of asking a friend of mine, what do Mormons believe? And or what theory do Mormons believe? And I got a what are you talking about? answer because that's not a general conversation of what atonement theory do Mormons hold to. Um and all of a sudden I see that there's going to be a book written about Latter-day Saint perspectives on atonement. Um, atonement, from the time I first started studying Mormonism, I was so interested. I would always hear people saying that they were using the atonement, and I didn't know that that was a verb. It was a, I, I, The way that this was imagined was very interesting to me. And there was also not very much 
theology done. And I think that's becoming more and more that Mormons are more and more doing theological work um, and trying to participate in these dialogues. Um, and so I really appreciate that this was kind of a look at of trying to take one of the most central ideas in Mormon cosmology um, and try to parse out what that means. And it draws connection between, it looks at the classical atonement theories, it looks at how Mormonism can fit into those. And I think this was really significant to me because it was one of the first times that I really saw someone and people in Mormon studies trying to bridge the gap between Mormon Mormonism and uh, Christian perspectives on atonement and trying to be part of that conversation and trying to be part of this broader dialogue. Uh, so for anyone who's interested in theology and in kind of interfaith dialogue, um, I think this is a really significant book um, in that it responds to a lot of the really current discussions within um, Christianity, and it has Mormonism enter into that. And so I think that's something for, it's not history, I realize, but if anyone interested in theology um, or how Mormonism fits in with these bigger conversations, I cannot recommend it enough. All right, thanks. All right. What else do what else you want to say? Well, you mentioned a couple of books with a similar theme relating to race and Native Americans. Uh, the first one came out early in the year. It's Imperial Zions, uh, Religion, Race, and Family in the American West and the Pacific by Amanda Hendricks Comito. Uh, this was released by the University of Nebraska Press. Uh, it's a brief book that contains six essays uh, that she wrote. Uh, they include titles such as The Race and Sex of God, The Bonds Between Sisters, uh, Redeeming the Lamanites in Native America and the Pacific, uh, Making Native Kin, uh, Native Zions, and Creating Polygamous Domesticities. A very interesting and fascinating book. Um, the reviewer for this book wrote, at the heart of imperial Zions is the notion of relationships between races and cultures and religions and families. One can hardly consider every single facet of Latter-day Saint internal and external relationships in a single volume, but certainly the polygamy of late Nauvoo and early Utah is pivotal uh, to determine in how most other Mormon relationships in these periods were constructed. Uh, indeed, one of my favorite parts of Imperial Zions were the narratives that often focused on women like Mary Fielding Smith and their experiences with polygamy. Imperial Zions contains a wealth of information regarding the effects of Mormon religionization and colonization on the indigenous peoples and lands. A very important and fascinating book on how uh, uh, Mormon ideas and ideas about marriage and race impacted what was going on as the Mormons colonized early Utah. Uh, the other related volume, and I'm going to apologize to Farina King right now, is uh, Dene du Gamali. Naval Latter-day Saint Experiences in the 20th Century, and I'm sure I slaughtered that pronunciation, just barely out from the University Press of Kansas. Uh, and in this book, uh, she traces Diné experiences with the church over the last 150 years, with the focus being on about the last 50 years into the present. Uh, there's a lot of missionaries uh, in this book, and church schools, uh, both uh, through like Brigham Young, as well as on the Diné lands, and uh, the, the church uh, practice of bringing uh, young natives into white people's homes and that kind of thing. Uh, the final chapter uh, talks about the experiences of uh, contemporary Diné in the church today. It is a book uh, that is both personal and public. The stories throughout are well rendered, often touching, and always purposely set forth to remind its readers uh, that Diné are a living, breathing, and thinking, experiencing people today just as they were 150 years ago. Uh, very fascinating and important book if you want to understand uh, the impact of Mormonism on Native American cultures and, and what happened um, as white Mormons came in and colonized and kind of took over the lands in Utah and Idaho and these areas. Two excellent, fascinating works. Yeah, and that's exciting to see that this 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 recent blossoming of things about the connection between Mormonism and Native Americans and the impact uh, of colonization. You know, we've had several years of of significant works about 
you know, African American and African issues. Uh, but now to see this flowering is great. Let me just add to that. There's a new poetry collection that came out a couple months ago by Tacey M. Atsiti, uh, a DNA poet called At Wrist from the University of Wisconsin Press. And it's received very strong praise. Uh, she's, she's a Mormon, Dine or Navajo uh, woman, and this is her second major uh, poetry collection. Um, so, so, you know, with this and with, you know, Farina King, you know, these are, these are Dine scholars, authors who are, who are, you know, we're hearing their, their own voice coming through to these things. And that's great. I've also just, in connection, I've, uh, I, I enjoy listening to the, the Sunstone History Podcast to um, Brian Buchanan and Lindsay Hanson Park's history. And then they've entered, they've started talking about uh, the early history of the Mormons coming into Utah and colonizing Mormons. And they're really forefronting, cent- making center of their story, the impact they've had and with the Native Americans at the time. So again, that seems like I've been hearing a lot about these things lately. So it's good. I think you're in the middle of something, Andrew. You're going to, just about to bridge to another thing too, right? Oh, no, no, you're good. Go right ahead. Well, okay. No, no, I'm done. Do you, do you want to tell us another, about another book? Oh, sure. Uh, a couple others that are both race related, yeah. not directly Mormon, but both by Mormon authors uh, that came out this year and were very interesting to me. Um, Mormon audiences are going to be familiar with Matthew Bowman, who's written a lot of Mormon uh, historical works. He wrote a book called The Abduction of Betty and Barney Hill, Alien Encounters, Civil Rights, and the New Age in America. And it's about this couple, Betty and Barney Hill, who uh, she was white, he's black, and they were both very involved in uh, their uh, liberal church back in the early 60s and in the civil rights movement. And they claim to have been abducted by aliens. And they uh, told this story, and it was reported in the press in various ways and retold over the years, made into movies. And everybody kind of interprets it in their own fashion and what this meant and, and tried to interpret what happened to them. And, and Bowman tries as hard as he can to go back and analyze it uh, from a historical perspective and put it into context with what was going on at the time with the civil rights movement and race, and the change in religious perspectives in America. And and I think this will be fascinating to Mormon audiences because of the author and because of the unfortunate connection time the church had with racism and the civil rights movement and and all the things that were going on in the 1960s. Very interesting and fascinating book on how our views of race and religion impact the way we interpret events. And and very, a very interesting book. the other one is by another Mormon author, uh, Devery S. Anderson, who also works over at Signature Books, a uh, favorite publisher of mine. Uh, he wrote The Story of Clyde Kenner, a Slow Calculated Lynching. Again, not a, direct, one, not a lot of direct Mormon content, although a very fascinating uh, fact. The foreword is written by James Meredith, the individual who is finally able to get the University of Mississippi desegregated. He took his interest to go there in part because when he was in the military, uh, he was in Utah. And he mentions that I visited, and he wrote the uh, foreword to this book. And he says, I visited the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City, and they told me in so many words to get your black ass out of here. That is something I will never forget. I was shocked. It was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. I probably never would have gone to Ole Miss without that experience. So (laughs) have Having a racist run-in on Temple Square was what kind of got his um, kind of life going in the direction it did with getting that desegregated. Uh, but before he had tried, Clyde Kennard tried to attend uh, a white university in Mississippi, and the racist power structure was so against him, they actually had some charges trumped up, had him arrested. This led to his death. And, and Devery Anderson just does a wonderful and fascinating job of detailing Kennard's life and the tragedies and all the things that happened and just does an absolutely beautiful job of telling his story and I highly recommend both of those books to anyone interested in the civil rights movement and race in the United States and again the role that religion and other things kind of play and connect with that two excellent books that came out earlier this year okay Christina how about you what else do you want to 
Yeah, so I think this is my last one. Um, I wanted to mention Brooke Brassard's uh, Thirsty Land into Springs of Water, and it is a history on Mormonism in Canada. Um, I am pretty interested in this because, for those who don't know, I'm moving to Canada, and uh, she is a Canadian um, historian. And when we imagine, maybe this is just me, it's probably just me, but when I imagine global Mormon studies, I never think about Canada. I think about the global South. I think about Mormonism in Japan. I think about Mormonism not in Canada. Um, and then I read um, a book on Mormon polygamy in Canada, Secret Lives of Saints, and I realized that Mormonism was actually really significant in Canada. Have either of you heard of the Social Credit Party? Yeah, oh. conservative party in Canada, right? And guy J. Jim, so my fiance told me about this because he listened to a guy, J. Jim McCullough, talk about the Social Credit Party. And it's like, on top of it being an economic thing, it's also like anti-Semitic and has Freemason conspiracies and was like hugely backed by the Mormons of Alberta. It was like a bit. And there was all these kind of little things about Mormonism in Canada that I just didn't know about, that they were very culturally significant in Alberta. Um, that's all to say. Um, so Brooke Broussard, she tells the story of what Mormonism in Southern Alberta was like from 1887 to 1947, this pretty broad um, period of time where Mormons enter into Canada for reasons related to polygamy. They're outsiders in a range of ways, um, and they really do try to maintain their identity as different, but yet also part of the Canadian world. Um, and how they kind of negotiate this identity of being a minority, but also just trying to exist. And it it it's a great book for someone who's interested in looking at what the world was actually like on the ground. She does a lived religion perspective, um, but also just considering broadly that there is a whole country up there that we just rarely talk about in Mormon studies, at least I think, um, or at least I rarely see it. And so I think she does a really good job of um, bringing to attention what that global global Mormonism is a lot more local and a lot closer to us than we imagine, and how that plays out in this time period was really significant. Um, so highly recommend for anyone who's interested in that. Also check out Social Credit. I don't even know. Well, here I'll I'll, get, I'll do another literary connection. Uh, Martin Levitt who is a wonderful young adult novelist, uh, has a new novel called Buffalo Flats, again, young adult, a historical novel about uh, a Canadian LDS family who go up to the Northwest Territories, much farther to the north, uh, and homestead up there in the 1890s. And, you know, this is a, it's a nationally published, or I guess, you know, it, it's, it, I think, I'm not sure if it's a Canadian publisher or not, but it's, it's a, it's a, Oh, it's Random House. No, it's Random House. So it's an, it's an, it's a North American nationally published uh, novel, but uh, the Mormonness of this family is a big part of this novel. You see that sometimes in 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 novels for adults, but not so much for young adults. They kind of avoid religion a lot of the time. So it's nice to see that a novel where the Mormonness of this family is central to the story. And Martin Levitt's, you know, one of our great YA authors. So I'm I'm interested in reading that. Uh, also, Jen for Quist, our uh, fiction editor, out outgoing fiction editor here at Dialogue, is um, from Alberta. And she, uh, often her novels have dealt with LDS in Canada. So let's look for that. Okay, let me talk about uh, novels. Here, let me talk about a few more novels. Like I said, it was kind of a quiet year for novels with LDS themes and by LDS authors this year. Uh, I guess two that come to mind are about BYU in the recent years and take a, a, a satirical and critical, but also affectionate look at the culture of BYU. One of them was by Theric Jepson called Just Julius Fine, which is set at BYU in the early 2000s, a story of a young woman who has been pigeonholed by her sex and her attractiveness into a life centered on finding a suitable marriage partner. Uh, you know, she's pushed into kind of a family studies major, the assumption that that's what she should do, preparing for a life of mothering and homemaking. And then we we see her discovering a new world uh, world around that, new possibilities uh, 
outside of those possibilities that are set up for her. Very funny novel. Derek is is one of our uh, leading comic authors. Uh, we had a, I had a talk with him and Stephen Carter about comedy in Mormon literature on this podcast feed uh, a few months ago. So look at please listen to that if you have a chance. Um, I, I very much enjoyed this this novel. Uh, very polyphonic. We see lots of, it's not just through her eyes. We actually don't see through Julie's eyes until the end of the novel. We're seeing from all these other people around her. Starts out very funny. There's a lot of very serious themes about um, race and gender issues and LGBT issues and uh, Heavenly Mother in this novel as well. So I highly recommend that. Also, William Morris uh, has a novella called The Unseating of Dr. Smoot about if, if the first novel just really finds about students, this is about faculty members. Um, this is about a faculty member, a, a Mormon with Utah roots, but she's at the University of Wisconsin, but she's coming back to Utah to give a talk at BYU and have a job interview at UVU, Utah Valley University, and a very interesting look at uh, academic culture in these places and how that fits with a academic Mormon who's kind of on the edge of Mormon society, on the edge of respectability in her family and different things like that. So, um, yeah, two, two interesting, uh, and critical looks at BYU in the last few decades. Uh, one other novel is Ben Spendlove has an, has a novel called the freezer through by common consent press, which is an apocalyptic speculative fiction novel about the end of the world, basically the world's coming to an end and an attempt by humanity to send out spaceships out to find a new place to live. But most of humanity is doomed and there's a couple at the center of this story who are not Mormon themselves, but are involved in Mormon society. And it's about, very much about, in the face of, of apocalypse and doom, do we bring in children to this world if we do what you know what does that mean uh what's the the role of family in a difficult world and and so clearly he's got i think connections to not the apocalyptic current world but the certainly very difficult current world and the role of family in a difficult and scary world uh so it's gotten uh, a very strong view that i was just reading so that's called The Freezer by Ben Spendla. A um, couple novels I haven't read yet, but I've heard some things about. John Benyon, uh, also by Common Consent Press, has uh, also an apocalyptic novel, Ruth at the End of the Earth, uh, set in a post-apocalyptic Utah. And uh, Karen Anderson has a novel through Tory House called What Falls Away, about a young woman who grew up in Utah, small town Utah, but um, it w had, a, had a child at, as a young woman, a single young woman, and was pushed into this system where called the baby drop system, where basically girls were encouraged to go off somewhere, have their baby, give it up for adoption very quickly, and never have any more, uh, you know, never talk about it again, basically, in the, in the, the 60s and 70s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and that's got some mixed reviews. I've seen some, some very strong reviews. We actually have a review coming out in dialogue that is is critical, very positive about her her way that she discusses this whole baby drop issue and the impact that has on had on young women at the time, but is not very positive about uh, stereotypical uh, portrayals of Mormons in the novel. So, uh, but I've also read some very good reviews of it as well. Um, Brandon Sanderson always has. Great novels. He has a, a couple of these Kickstarter novels that were done over COVID uh, that are just coming out this year. Probably the ones that have gotten the highest best reviews are You Mean the Nightmare Painter, a fantasy set in kind of an Asian inspired world, uh, fantasy world with some interesting uh, romance and religious angles in it. And also a young adult fantasy called Tests of the Emerald Sea that's I've gotten good reviews for its humor. Uh, I said it's been compared to Princess Bride. Uh, so, and these are, I, I've seen several people say these are the best Sanderson novels in a long time. So Brandon Sanderson, one of our most popular nationally published novels, novelist, and who I've always enjoyed, but I can't keep up with him. He, he puts out so many novels. 
uh, has got some new ones. Okay. Any more? I think you both said you had, you were on the last round, but, but, but what else you got? Andrew, do you, I think we have some more from you. I do have a few more items I'd like to cover. Um, since you were mentioning, uh, fiction and a few, uh, things of that nature, I will uh, mention some poetry. I don't do poetry very often. Never really much of a poetry person, but mm-hmm. there's some very good poetry out this year from BCC Press that she mentioned. Uh, my favorite was, uh, and I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong again tonight, Catabasis, uh, Monologues for the Dead by Heather Harris Bergevin. Um, Catabasis, if you're not familiar with the term, is a journey that you take to the underworld, to the realm of the dead, and then you return uh, a light with some sort of special knowledge. Think of uh, Odysseus or uh, Enkidu in Gilgamesh uh, and their descents into the underworld, and then they come back you know, with some sort of special knowledge. Uh, in the beginning of her book, uh, Heather writes, uh, the descending and ascending aspect is a sort of chiasmus concept, this going downward into the depths of Hades on some impossible mission, and then turning, fighting your way back out again when disallowed daylight. No word, however, has been better encapsulated my last few years, nor this little offering. Uh, the structure of this book is intentionally darker in the middle than at either end, with the denouement being one of peaceful contentment. And, and I just absolutely loved uh, this book that uh, Heather uh, wrote. Uh, she takes you on this journey through some of the trials of her life and things she's experienced, her and her children, and uh, has just written some absolutely uh, beautiful uh, poetry. I think I might share one little um tidbit here. Uh, she mentions that she has a non-binary child, uh, which I do as well. So this was particularly touching to me. And uh, she talks about how the father of this child believes in a God that rejects their very soul. And then writing about how she can't believe in a God like that, Heather writes, I believe God is bigger, wider, weirder, and wilder than the most frail imaginings framing the divine in ways we can grab grasp easily in bite-sized bars of chocolate in Sunday school. You burned clean away my need for a simple, happy, frivolous God who doesn't understand grief or pain or abuses or IEPs or broken doors and people. I have no more Sunday school answers and have no option but to rely wholly upon deity, whether called God, Father, Elohim, Mother, Universe. The universe loves you, I explain. She loves you and you are hers. She wants good things uh, for you. And uh, it is a very touching and wonderful and beautiful book, uh, Catabasis, Monologues for the Dead by Heather Harris Bergevin. Uh, You mentioned a moment ago, Andrew, um, Tory House Press. I just discovered Tory House Press this year almost by accident, and I've fallen in love with several other books. One of my favorite was one that came out uh, this past summer called When I Was Red Clay, A Journey of Identity, Healing, and Wonder by Jonathan T. Bailey. Uh, Bailey is an artist and a poet. Uh, He writes a lot on uh, nature in southern Utah. And uh, this is a book he wrote about his experiences growing up uh, neurodivergent and gay in a very conservative uh, southern Utah community and all of the trials related to that, the bullying and things and that occurred. And uh, anyone uh, who has queer family members or, or is curious and understanding more about the queer experience in uh, Mormonism or in Utah really needs to read this book. Um, I'll just share one fascinating, one, one statement he wrote uh, that really touched me again. He says, uh, Bailey writes, in the wake of loss, We pick up our brushes, our sewing needles, our microphones, and our pens, and we create a better world, regardless of whether we can inhabit it. We make loving families and open-armed communities. In literature and art, we create new worlds where being different is not only tolerated, but celebrated. Little by little, we lay nourishing soils where once we knew hard pan and plant seeds of inclusivity in our lives and for generations to follow. And for me, uh, this book really helped to do uh, just that. So I hope many people will be willing to check out uh, When I Was Red Clay, 
uh, by Jonathan T. Bailey, an amazing little book. Um, a few others, if you're okay with me, throwing them out here. Uh, interrupt me at any time if you want somebody else to have a turn. For a long time, we haven't had a good biography of um, Joseph F. Smith, or I should maybe say we don't have we haven't had a um, academic biography. We had uh, you know, biographies by his son Joseph Fielding Smith, who was also a president of the church, and by uh, Francis Gibbons that were very devotional in nature. Nothing wrong with that, but nothing academic. And uh, Stephen Taysom and the University of Utah Press finally gave us one earlier this year. And Taysom wrote an absolutely wonderful, fascinating, well-written book on Joseph Fielding Smith. Uh, his approach is to try and avoid analyzing Joseph Fielding Smith. Instead, he tries to show how he fit into the events around him and reacted to those, uh, some of which really just kind of shook him uh, to the core of his being. Talks about all the experiences that Joseph Fielding Smith had. Uh, Joseph F. Smith, trying not to confuse my Joseph Fielding Smith, there were so many of them, and uh, how these impacted his life and the way he uh, functioned as a general authority and the way he ran the church. And a very good, it's a very good and important book. I would encourage people to check out. Uh, the final uh, heavy uh, book I want to mention uh, is one of uh, September 6th and the Struggle for the Soul of Mormonism by Sarah M. Patterson from Signature Books. Uh, and this book is in uh, two parts. The first part is called The Purity System, and then the second part is called The Scenting Voices. And what Patterson does very well in this book, it's not just the story of uh, the September 6th. You get that in the second part. Uh, there's a chapter on each of the members of the six that wanted to be uh, included in the book. Uh, one chapter for each of the five of them, and she tells their story and what uh, they did that led to them being excommunicated, writes about their uh, excommunication or disciplinary process and their journey afterwards. But even more important to me is the first half of the book where she talks about the Mormon purity system. Now, if you're familiar with the writings of Marcus Borg, if you've ever read Meeting Jesus Again uh, for the first time, Borg talks a lot about the Jewish purity system and how it impacted everything in Jewish life back then and how important that was in the New Testament writings and how it really shaped the world that uh, Jesus lived in. Uh, Patterson basically does the same thing for Mormonism. She gives uh, a retelling of the doctrinal, familial, and bodily purity systems in the church and how this all relates to the way Mormons tell history and how important it is for the general authorities to very carefully monitor uh, this and how um, correlation came into all of this and this need to kind of control uh, the story uh, for the, by the general authorities and the need to make sure that things are portrayed in a certain way and how uh, the various members of the September 6th came along and uh, disrupted uh, the system and how that led to their excommunication in an attempt to control the story and how that impacted not only the church then, but still continues to uh, to this day. Uh, it does have a few unfortunate editorial and historical errors in it. It was kind of rushed out to try and get out in time uh, for the anniversary, uh, the 30th anniversary uh, this last year of um, the events in the, or the 40th. However long ago, uh, 1993 was now. I'm getting my years off probably a little bit. Uh, but a very good and important book, and I encourage everyone to check that one out. All right. Thank you. Christina, do you have any more you want to add? Uh, I just wanted to note, uh, we were talking before, um, the first thing, the Joseph Smith Papers Project is over, Brent. This is the end. Joseph Smith has died. The books are coming to a close. Um, and that was, I mean, for anyone in Mormon studies, we all know that that resource was absolutely invaluable. So the final um, installments of that are out. And just worth noting that that was just such a great project. Everyone who worked on it was incredible. Um, and then there's also like a million different series on Mormonism. University of Illinois has one. Um, Signature is doing one um, on a bunch of biographies. So if you like someone in Mormon history, 
absolutely likely that they will have a very short biography coming out in the next few years. Right. I, I'm, I have the, the Joseph F. Smith biography, and I also have the new one on um, canon. That seems like I think that will go very well, very well with that. That's that's I, I think that's a signature one. Uh, it, and Christina, you have a book coming out as part of the University of Illinois series, right? Can you give preview that for us? You, um, I wrote a short, as it would say, short biography on Joseph Musser. It's called A Mormon Fundamentalist. He is a Mormon fundamentalist, as you'd imagine. Um, he sometimes, uh, Brian, um, Hales. Uh, dubbed him the father of Mormon fundamentalism. It's true. Um, so in the early years, kind of this very odd relationship between the people excommunicated in the 20s and 30s, 30s that were like still Mormon, but still practicing polygamy because apostles were sealing them to people in the 20s. And what do you do with these people that don't care about the manifesto? And why is Joseph F. Smith having a baby during the Reed Smoot hearing? And what do we do with this very weird time? And so... Um, tried to tell that story. Also, he was like very good friends with Jay Golding Kimball. <laughs> um, and so trying to tell the story of Mormon fundamentalism through this guy who I've come to just think is so rad in the history of the untold histories of Mormonism. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, another one I'll add from that series is, well, not actually that series, the signature series uh, of short, short biographies is Stephen Carter's biography of Virginia Sorensen pioneer Mormon author. Uh, I think Virginia Sorensen is our great Mormon author of the 20th century. She, she did a series of novels about Mormons, uh, uh, pioneer Mormons, and different generations, particularly from of Danish descent, and Little Lord Than the Angels, and The Evening in the Morning, maybe her two most famous ones. And Stephen Carter just did a great job of going through all of her novels, all of her children's books as well. And I'm excited about reading more of these. They're hard to find. You have to really search for them, get on your library alone. But he really inspired me to do that. And I'm, that's one of the things that I'm doing over this uh, holiday week is digging into some of those Virginia Sorensen novels. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned some, uh, poetry books. Let me give one more, Andrew. Uh, Darlene Young's Here, also from BCC Press. Uh, I just love Darlene's poems. Uh, she has this very distinctive poetic voice, uh, very funny, clever, uh, self-deprecating, but also self-affirming. Um, she, you know, looking at the lived reality of a mother, uh, a woman going into middle age and facing empty nest, and I, I just love her poetry very much. So I highly recommend Darling Young's Here. All right. I think that's it. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a couple things to, to add real quick, Andrew, hey. if we can get those in. Uh, I also want to highly recommend the two series both of you mentioned. I uh, absolutely love both of them. They're short. You know, none of the books are longer than about 150 pages. So you're not going to get anything in depth, but uh, very good stuff. I love the volume on Vardis Fisher. I've lost track if it was University of Illinois or the Signature Series and how much fun that was in. Um, but very good stuff. A couple other fun series. Uh, Desert Books started their Let's Talk About series a couple of years ago, and now they're up to about a dozen volumes. Again, very brief. Uh, they, they fit in your shirt pocket just about. The only main complaint I have is I'm getting old. I just turned 51 a few days ago, and the, the print's a little small. Uh, but they're very good. I really love W. Paul Reeves' uh, volume on race and the priesthood that came out earlier this year. Very blunt, very straightforward. He covers a lot of the, the, he, the history and, and the very blunt about what happened there. A very good little volume uh, for people to pick up. One I more. That volume, I thought that volume was so important. I mean, Paul Reeves' yes. important work, but, you know, it's, it's in these very big academic vo uh, volumes. And for him to come out with this very readable, very accessible book that really states very clearly the issues, uh, the mistakes that the church has done w over race and have that published by Desert Book, I, I think is. Yeah, yeah. Very, very good. Very good book by Desert Book. Very digestible to any audience can read and comprehend what, what Reeve has in here. Very good. The other series I just absolutely love that concluded this year was... 
The Book of Mormon for the Least of These by Margaret Olson Hemming and Fatima and Soleil. And again, if I'm saying people's names wrong, I greatly apologize. But this is a three volume book, also, or three volume set of books, uh, also from BCC Press. And these two ladies have written a magnificent commentary uh, on the Book of Mormon about the uh, social justice aspects of the book, commenting on how it uh, teaches about uh, race and social justice and trying to do better uh, in understanding the feminism and other things in there. And really very, very good. I highly encourage anyone to check uh, this series out. Very, very uh, in-depth and um, insightful. Uh, what these uh, two authors have pulled out of the Book of Mormon. And then a little bit of a pitch for one that's not even quite out yet, or maybe by the time this is online, uh, Benjamin Park uh, has a new book coming out, American Zion, A New History of Mormonism uh, from Live Right Press. This is the first uh, single volume history of the LDS Church to be published since the Joseph Smith Papers. And a very good and fascinating book. Uh, he, he very quickly goes through the history. So again, you're not going to get any particular incident in great uh, detail, but he brings out a lot of fascinating aspects of Mormon history and a very good book that will be released to a national audience uh, that I hope a lot of people check out. Great stuff. That did remind me, along the lines of Book of Mormon for the Least of These, Ryan Ward did publish with Coford. Um, and there was no poor among them, liberation, salvation, and the meaning of rest, kind of a liberation theology for Mormonism. Another good one, yes. And Margaret Olson, the co-author of the Book of Mormon for the least, least of These, will be, is coming in as our new one of our two new editors of Dialogue, along with Carolyn Klein. Awesome. So there's one more book we want to mention. Andrew, tell us about. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, a little earlier this year, Greg Coford Books uh, published a fascinating little book titled Life and Death on the Mormon Frontier, The Murders of Frank Lesur and Gus Gibbons by the Wild Bunch. Uh, this was written by Stephen C. Lesur, uh, an excellent author who has written on Missouri and other aspects of Mormon history uh, in the past. And in this book, he offers a fresh perspective on the Wild Bunch game made famous by their leader, Butch Cassidy. Uh, the author is a direct descendant of Frank Lesseur, and this book documents the author's findings as he studies all available sources related to the murder of his great uncle and Gus Gibbons. Uh, during his research, Lesseur found some discrepancies between the prevailing understanding by scholars as well as the stories circulating within the family. In this work, he makes no qualms about calling out these facts as he sees them, uh, even if they may counter cherished beliefs. He tries to take a historian's lens to a very personal uh, story. As you read this book, you get a wonderful sense of the life, what was life, what life, like, but, excuse me, what life was like on the frontier. Uh, he shows the humanity of those involved and does not seek to paint a hagiographic account of the early Latter-day Saints. Uh, he's very objective in his approach uh, when telling these stories and providing conclusions based on available facts. He provides biographical sketches of numerous individuals involved and does a great job of uh, bringing out what was folklore uh, in relation to the Wild Bunch, how they're often perceived as Robin Hood types or a robbing from the ranch, giving to the poor and all of that. Um, but it, yes, it is true that they tended to rob deep-pocketed individuals and railroads and banks, but they weren't quite so good at redistributing uh, this wealth to the poor as people like to portray in some of the stories about them. Um, however, they were generous to those who tended to protect and help them. But in this book, Lacerda does a great job of, of telling a very fascinating and engaging and readable story uh, that, again, it gives a very uh, interesting picture of early Mormon colonization efforts, uh, these wonderful stories that we are, are familiar with about the Wild Bunch, everything involved in that time, and just a wonderful uh, little book. And I encourage anybody to check that one out as well. Okay. Thank you so much, 
both for 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 joining us here and bringing your wisdom. I hope to do this again uh, next year. And thank you, everybody, who's listening to the Dialogue Book Report. This show is part of the Dialogue Podcast Network, a collective of independent podcasts who promote inquiry into all aspects of the LDS tradition. It includes wonderful shows like Angels and Seer Stones, a Latter-day Saint folklore podcast, in which the folklorists Christine and Christopher Blythe examine the lived religion of the Latter-day Saints, stories we tell and the beliefs we debate. The show is produced and edited by Daniel Foster Smith, who also provides music, and our content manager is Emily Jensen. To hear more, go to dialoguejournal.com. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Taylor Petrie, editor of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, and this is Dialogue Out Loud. My eyelashes were subtly coated in matte black mascara. On my cheeks, a light dusting of dusty rose-colored blush powder, just enough that I could feel comfortable and almost myself. On Tuesday, my visiting teacher said she knew I was really busy at work and brought over a casserole for dinner, the chief ingredient of which was zucchini. Maybe it isn't the Lamanite who needs to forsake the incorrect traditions of our forefathers. Maybe it's the belief of racial hierarchy that we need to forsake. Never learn to play the organ, the old woman told me. You might get a different calling from time to time, but make no mistake, once you get on the path of becoming a ward organist, that's what you'll be until you die. Each year, we bring you even more great fiction, personal essays, and poetry taken from the pages of our quarterly journal. We couldn't do this without your support. So thank you for reading, listening, and supporting Dialogue with your donations, subscriptions, or by simply leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. For more content like this, or to get involved with Dialogue events, go to dialoguejournal.com. Dialogue Podcast Network.